very often, especially in, in, in technical death metal, I, I notice that people, they make fun of other genres, they make fun of pop music, for example, right? But a lot of like 80s pop music is a lot more sophisticated and intelligent in terms of arrangement. <laughs> What you guys might find a little surprising when looking at Christian playing, um, he often appears to just use two fingers of his left hand, of his fretting hand, and uh, some of you might have heard of it, uh, some of you might have not heard of it yet. Yeah, I have a, a neurologic condition in my fretting hand, which is called focal dystonia. Uh, it's basically something that is acquired by practicing too much with wrong practice habits. Um, basically, I've had it since at least nine or ten years, so for the biggest part of my career almost. Like, and I guess on ten out of eleven records that I did, I've already had it, and all the tours I played, I had it. In the beginning, I didn't know I have it. I was just wondering why certain things that used to work suddenly don't work anymore. And it took me like two or three years until I got the um, correct diagnosis. So what happens is that in the brain, the movement centers for these two fingers, they overlap. So whenever this finger puts pressure on the strings, this one starts to curl. So I can't really use it as much as you could in a healthy hand. So I had to alter my technique a lot. So you see me use a lot of like index finger slides where I just use position shifts. Um, sometimes I would play notes like this. And um, what I actually did was develop a tapping technique where I included other fingers of my right hand. So basically what I did was um, rework many of the fingerings that I use uh, so that I can basically avoid the middle finger of my left hand. So where in the past I would, for example, play a diminished aperture like this. Um, nowadays I would use just two fingers of my left hand and then two fingers of my right hand. So I started tapping with my ring finger and my uh, pinky of my right hand as well to make up for the loss of the second finger on the left hand. So this is something that I would do for diminished aperture instead of playing them, for example, like this. Um, or even things that you could sweep pick, I reworked by using more fingers of my right hand. For example, I would play an E minor triad like this. Alright, so this is just one of the couple of variations I do. I mean, I still use sweep picking in all the traditional techniques, but I just had to alter my finger rings and uh, many things I had to think about, like, mm, how am I going to play this, right? But a nice thing is it makes you creative in a way and play things that you probably wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So I try to make, make an advantage out of this. I was actually uh, talking to Marty Friedman and I was like, man, I have this uh, thing on my left hand and many things I can't play the way I used to. And he's like, man, you don't have to play like anyone else. And he was then, he told me just look at Django Reinhardt or Tony Iommi or even Chris Poland who played for Megadeth, right? All had like limitations in their fretting hand and they used it in a very creative way to create their signature sound. So, uh, and that kind of stuck with me, I guess. I have my very own band, which I started in 2016, called Eternity's End, which is a neoclassical power metal band with clean vocals. Um, Something very different. Yeah, but this is actually my real background. I mean, I'm not as much of a death metal guy as people think. I just got stuck in the scene for some reason, but uh, I'm a, a classic metal guy. I prefer clean vocals. I mean, I, I grew up with Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and Ingrid Malmsteen and Symphony X and those kind of bands. So um, Eternity's End is basically the kind of band I wanted to do since the 90s. And it took me 20 years to finally make it happen. So two years ago we released the first record. We had a little bit of bad luck because our label uh, went bankrupt and the record didn't really get the promotion it deserved. And it was also perceived a little bit like a guitar player solo kind of thing with a vocalist, which it wasn't intended to be. Now we have um, a second guitar player on board as well, which is Phil Tugas from First Fragment, which is a, also a Tactus band that people are familiar with. And he's a big power metal fan as well, just like me. <laughs> and we wrote the album together. And we got uh, Mike Lepore from Symphony X mm -hmm. playing bass, which is amazing for me because they're my favorite band. And I got my favorite metal singer of all time, Yuri Sanson, from Brazil's band Hybria, who just disbanded. Um, and he joined us for vocals on this record. And um, yeah, so we're currently in recording mode for this one. As I said previously, a new Alkaloid record comes out. So these are my two main projects. And um, after finishing the Eternity's End record, uh, I hope to be able to collect material as well for a new solo record. 
So the songwriting for Eternity's End, does it work as you explained that in some kind of an interview a couple of years ago with just using, first of all, Guitar Pro? Yeah. Yes. Typing in the notes. That's basically what I do. I mean, I, I, of course, I mess around with the guitar. It was basically the traditional way to write songs, and I just collect riffs, which I either record or I write them down in Guitar Pro. Uh, and eventually, over time, things start to turn into songs. I arrange them in Guitar Pro, so I have the drums and the bass and the keyboards. I just export MIDI tracks from those, so I just demo them. But just the guitars are real and demos, the rest is just MIDI instruments. Uh, I write the vocal melodies on the guitars. Uh, and then when I have the melody, I write the lyrics to fit the syllables to, so that they fit the notes. And then I send the demos to the guys, basically. And then everyone records his real tracks, basically, to my demos. And then, I, in the end, I redo the guitars to fit with the micro-timing of the drums and everything. And um, for my solo material, I do it like that too. And then Obscure and Alkaloid and even Necrophages, we actually did the entire songs just in Guitar Pro. But I switched to the system of demoing the songs in recent years because I think it sounds a little bit more organic. Because in Guitar Pro, it always sounds good when you have a lot of notes, it doesn't sound good when you have little notes, but with a real guitar tone, with distortion, it often works very differently than you would think when you just have the MIDI. So that's why, I, since my second solo record, um, I'm actually demoing everything before doing the final versions. Right now you mentioned something which I would like to point out a little, um, especially the, the Epitaph album of uh, Necrophagist. Mm -hmm. uh, so people don't seem to have gotten it that you actually put a lot of work into that and as a composer as well for the lead guitars. Yeah, this is true. I mean, I wrote 50% um, of the solos. Uh, of course, I had some help from Mohammed because in those days uh, I was very young, I used to overplay and he had better ideas sometimes for the phrasing and stuff. But um, it's, we don't get songwriting credits for a solo, of course. I mean, it's the same as a Rust in Peace album. Marty Friedman did his own solos, but it, of course it doesn't show in the songwriting credits. But it's kind of a song have, within a song, isn't it? Yeah, kind of, but solos also count a bit as an improvisation, right? It's just that some people seem to think that uh, someone else wrote my solos, which actually wasn't the case. I actually even wrote some of the bass lines on the record. I wrote the bass lines for Step Wound and the stillborn one. I wrote a couple of riffs in the last song, uh, Symbiotic in Theory. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, if I hadn't been dependent on someone else, it still would have sounded pretty similar, but, but there's quite some input, especially in the lead guitars and yeah, some of the bass lines, basically, as well. Because, like, uh, Step Wound has this, like, little tapping thing, which is something that I got from guitar bass, like Greg Howe and Michael Romeo, and I just thought it would be cool to have the bass do something like this. So there's definitely a couple of spots in there, apart from the solos, which are uh, definitely me, yeah. So, when uh, the Epitaph album came out by Nico Fargus, I guess this really kind of triggered a whole new genre. It triggered a wave going across the globe, and uh, everywhere, technical, basically technical death metal bands popped up. So, what do you think about this evolution of metal? Yeah, I have um, mixed feelings towards it. Um, I, of course, as I <clears throat> said, I mean, for a musician, influencing other people is like the biggest achievement, basically, you can have as a musician and the biggest compliment. Uh, I don't like too much the direction in which it developed. I mean, um, I think a lot of stuff is only about people showing what they can play. Everyone plays as much as they can all the time. Uh, people don't really write songs anymore. They don't really consider chord progressions and things like that anymore. It's all about the physical aspect of playing. Um, I, I miss the arrangements that we had, for example, in Necrophagist, where not everyone was playing as much as they can all the time, but the things were actually very thought out. And I also don't like the, 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 the term technical death metal because it really just points out to the actual motor skill involved, right? But music shouldn't be about that. I mean, the motor skill is just a tool that you use to play, uh, to, to, to get uh, em emotions across. And uh, if, if, if the motor skill becomes the main focus, the music lacks something for me. And uh, for me, death metal needs to be dark and needs to have this kind of morbid atmosphere that you found in the, in the bands of the 90s. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm much more into, into bands like, I don't know, like Disincarnate or Immolation or Monstrosity, like the older bands from the 90s who also did technical and progressive stuff, but in a more smart way. It wasn't so much in your face. It wasn't like, hey, look, we can play um, sweep arpeggios and blast beats on 300 BPM and this is all that our music is about. Because um, 
I personally do not understand why this would be a reason for someone to, 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 to listen to a band. And even though this was definitely there in Necrophages, maybe not in the speeds that bands do it nowadays, but I mean, this aspect was there. It was never um, the main focus in the music. And even though I'm very flattered that people are influenced by what we did, I think they focus on only one very superficial element, which was not the main aspect that the songs that Mohammed had written uh, were actually about. So, uh, I mean, not saying this doesn't apply to all bands, and sometimes there's bands still where it's, it's think like, wow, I mean, this is, this is really fucking cool, and I wish I could have thought of that. So, uh, but the majority of stuff that I hear, and I only know it through teaching, because I don't listen to that stuff myself too much, but this is usually what I recognize. Lack of arrangement, everyone playing as much as they can all the time, but no real songwriting or atmosphere or feeling or emotion being involved. This is my um, personal opinion. Is that your approach with Alkaloid? Bringing back the musicality in a uh, way? I mean, we hope to. I mean, I, I, everything that I do, I, I, I try to do this and the, and the way it's being played is, is basically only the, the, the last thought, right? It's, I, I never think, oh, now we have to write a song that people know we can play six string sweeper patches or something like that, right? It's more about finding an interesting chord progression that evokes a specific type of feeling, finding a melody or an arrangement where you think a little bit around the corner, which is not the most obvious thing um, that you could do. Very often the, 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 the progressive aspects are quite hidden, right? It's like, uh, it's like, for example, you have like a guitar riff that goes on in 5-8 all the time, the drums do a 4 4 rhythm on it, and it invokes a specific kind of uh, 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 feeling of urgency in the song, right? Uh, uh, something, something like that. Um, you even meet. It's, usually, it's really about finding nice chord progressions, unusual chord progressions, being melodic, but not in the typical uh, overused, say, yeah, overused, overused uh, way. standard uh, uh, diatonic chord break kind of way. I mean, nothing wrong with that. But I, I like when there's a little bit of a twist in it, right? Where you, where you think differently, and I like. Arrangements, and this is what we try to do in Alcala a lot, where not, uh, as I said, not all the instruments play as much as they can all the time, but it's more where the, the part itself by the individual instrument might not even be that much, but it's the, when you put it all together, this is basically what then in the end makes a song. So, I mean, very often, especially in, in, in technical death metal, I, I notice that people, they make fun of other genres, they make fun of pop music, for example, right? But a lot of like 80s pop music is a lot more sophisticated and intelligent in terms of arrangement than uh, bands which just play blast beats and arpeggios at 300 BPM and that's basically all they do. So, uh, and in alcohol especially, we try to go over the boundaries uh, of specific genres and just try to mix it all, basically. I mean, a new album, there's a lot of 80s prog rock influence the album starts out sounding more like Yes or Police, basically, but then uh, <laughs> there comes a, a very unexpected change very suddenly, and uh, so people will have a hard time to, 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 to judge this record at first, I guess. So there have been songs released so far, yes. and uh, I remember this insane... Um, it appeared on the first album as well, these in insane overtone yeah. things. Yeah. How, how did you do that? This is actually quite simple. It's much much easier than you, than you think it is. It's basically... Um, so basically what we're doing is we're doing like just the left hand uh, legato thing on the fourth, sixth and seventh fret. And when you put your right hand middle finger over the fret of the eleventh fret, you have basically seven frets distance to the fourth fret and five to the sixth and four to the seventh. So basically all the distances where you would have natural overtones and then it just creates this uh, nice little effect. And that's basically how it's done. All right folks, thanks a lot for watching. Thanks so much to you, Chris, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It was my pleasure for showing us the different RD models of Ibanez, which are available, of course, at our website. If you liked our video, please comment, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe if possible, so we can keep this stuff coming. And I hope you will come again, meet us again, show us Me more too. of your stuff. Likewise, it was my pleasure. Bye! Bye!